Psychologists put six monkeys inside a room. Inside the room, there was a pole. At the top of the pole, there was a regime of bananas. The room was 20 feet long by 20 feet wide by 20 feet high. The monkeys could eat the bananas all they wanted for as long as they wanted. Stage two of the experiment was that when the monkeys began to climb the pole to eat, they experienced something brand new. They experienced ice cold water that came down under three shower heads. There were strobe lights, loud sirens, and it was just chaotic. It scared the monkeys half to death. They scurried down the pole and uh, little by little, they all shied away from to the point where eventually none of them had any desire to climb that pole and reach for a banana because they were conditioned that touching that banana meant that there was ice cold water, strobe lights, and loud sirens. The next stage of the experiment was the psychologist began to remove one monkey that was accustomed to what had been going on as normal behavior, and then they introduced a newbie, one that had never experienced any of that. Well, 100% of the time, every time they introduced a new monkey, the first reaction was the monkey would see the bananas, start to climb the pole, and was looking forward to a treat, but was met with screeching, screaming monkeys, five of them, pulling him down, jumping all around him, as if to say, don't ever, ever, ever think of doing that again. Eventually, the monkey didn't know why, but he just never did it again. He lost interest in the regime of bananas because of the social influences of the other five around him. Five became four and four became three and three became two. And eventually there were none of the original six monkeys that had tasted the bananas, experienced the ice cold water, strobe lights and showers and sirens. But here's where it really got interesting. When they introduced a new monkey to the six that had already never experienced the problem, they reacted in the same way as those who had been doused by the ice cold water. And eventually, after three months period, they rotated monkeys in and out, in and out, and in and out. And eventually, none of the ones that had ever been doused or screamed at or had water poured on their head in any way, never been terrorized, they refused to allow another monkey to go up that pole. The psychologists concluded this in their report. Behavior among monkeys is influenced as much or more by social pressures than it is by historical experience. Let me tell you another story. A daughter recently got married. She said to her mother, hey mom, listen, uh, the in-laws are coming over. It's our first Easter and I wanna host them and they're coming over. Could you teach me how to bake a ham? Sure, sweetheart. They went down, they bought a ham, they bought all their ingredients and uh, mother was showing daughter now how to bake the ham. The last thing the mother did before putting the ham in the pan was she cut two inches off the end of the ham, put it in the pan and then the pan in the oven. The daughter said, why did you cut the end off? Mother said, I don't know. That's what my mom did when she taught me how to bake a ham. So they picked up the phone and they talked to grandma. Grandma, why did you cut the end off the ham before you put it in the oven? Um, I'm not sure. That's the way my mom always did it. So they called great-grandmother. Great-grandma, why did you cut the end off the ham before you put it in the oven? Great-grandma said, because I never had a pan big enough to hold the whole thing, so I had to cut two inches off to make it fit. Now, when you put those two stories together, I wanna to propose to you that there's a social behavior. We have listened to voices when, when it comes to every aspect of our life. Financial management is one of them. So if you happen to grow up in a situation where the people that you loved most and respected the most were adverse to taking risks, you probably are prone to taking less risk. That's true in my case. Let me tell you a little bit about my story. My dad was born on the front porch of a home that his dad was building after he bought a house for $5 during the depression. He tore it apart board by board, even straightened out some of the nails if he could to re-salvage those. He had the home transported across town on a horse and wagon, and he had built this home post-depression, and now my dad, his son, was born on the front porch. That gives you a little bit of setting as to money was hard to come by. My dad was raised with the um, 
attitude that if you do not have cash, you do not buy. I saw my dad borrow money to buy a car one time in my life, a 1964 Plymouth. Within six months, he was so tired of the car payments, he sold the car and never again for the rest of my life until my dad died at the age of 81 did I ever know him to borrow money to buy a car. If you don't have cash, son, don't buy. Now, that was the way he ran his life. He lived well and he had lots of toys around him. He had a home that took care of seven kids and, and we all survived just fine. But here's where I want to tell you about the investment and the risk with if you don't have cash, don't buy. My dad had an opportunity to buy a cottage on a lake, a freshwater natural lake in the state of Maine, pristine. It's called Drew's Lake. It's in the town of New Limburg, just outside of the town of Holton, Northern Maine, beautiful lake. Could have bought the cottage for $13,000, but he didn't have cash and therefore he said, if I don't have cash, I don't buy. His sister, on the other hand, went 200 yards down, had the opportunity and bought another cottage that was $19,000. I don't know if she had a mortgage or not. The point is this, 28 years later, my aunt sold her cottage for over a quarter of a million dollars, the one she bought for about 18 or 19,000. My dad did not have a cottage to sell. Because why? A voice went off in his head, if you don't have cash, you don't buy. So now it came time for Brent. At age 22, I'm a married man. I decide what am I gonna do with my financial investment? Let me just tell you, I haven't had a lot of properties. I lived in Africa for 10 years of my life. So having a lot of money to invest was never an issue for me, but I always felt it was important to invest wisely. One of the things I had to overcome first was the voice of my father inside my head. If you don't have cash, you don't buy. So I forced myself with conservatism to take a little bit of money. I put money down on a house. I had that house for two years. I made $25,000 profit on the house when I sold it. I took that money. I bought another house. I only had to pay $44,000 for that house. It was an old Sears and Roebuck house and uh, remodeled it, had that house, rented that house out when I was in Africa. Someone else paid the mortgage and they made enough that I made 13 mortgage payments in a 12 month period, so I reduced the mortgage. And now someone else is buying my house because they're giving me rent money and I'm in Africa living as the landlord. My friend's watching my house. I sold that house for six times what I bought it for. Then I took that money, I bought another house, needed a lot of work. If I had been smart, I would have torn it down and kept the lot on the lake, but instead I tried to refix the cottage up on the lake. And now the story of my dad's cottage and my cottage are going back and forth in my head. I bought mine for 69,000. I put about 50 or 55,000 of materials in it. it. Took me 12 years to do it, but I sold it for $215,000. I took that money, went down to South Carolina, bought a rental property. I was living in New Jersey at the time. And with that money, I bought a home for $305,000 took a little bit of extra money, fixed it up, rented it out, rented it for the average of about $2,500 to $3,000 a week, depending on the supply and demand, July 4th being the highest rental month of the, of the year. But I made good money for five years of renting that house and then sold it for almost twice of what I paid for it five years later. I took that money and I am now in a home that is considered my retirement home and I have some money left over. Now, all of that to say this, if I had gone by the philosophy that I had heard as the monkey in the cage, my dad said, what? No cash, no buy. I wanna encourage you, my friend. I don't like a lot of risks, but I realize if you're gonna invest, it's gonna be risky because no one has a crystal ball, not the stock market, not real estate, not anything, but I encourage you. I happen to base a lot of my beliefs on the Bible, so I, I've lived with, uh, with this principle, 10, 10, 80. First 10%, God says, is his. I've always tried to honor God by giving 
of uh, every paycheck to God first. The second 10% is mine. That's for my long-term savings. I earned it. I worked for it. I save it for long-term. That's the stuff that I was buying for retirement. And then 80%, you force yourself to live on no more, no less. Don't try to live on more than your means. So there you have some of my story. I suggest to you there's a voice that goes off in your head, someone that you trusted. Maybe they were really, really good with money, and so you're really, really good with money. Maybe they were terrible at money management, and so you tend to be careless, and you don't make real good decisions. But here are five tips that I think would serve you well because I want to encourage you to invest even though it's risky because risk does end up paying you eventually. The first principle that will help you invest wisely is to become self-aware. Ask yourself, what voice am I listening to? Is it the voice of reason or is it the voice of someone else that I'm now being forced to live by their beliefs rather than my own. Become self-aware, know what voice you're listening to, and then determine if it's the voice that's going to take you to the place you want to be. Second thing that will help you is to always keep in mind a vision. Where do you want to end up? And are you listening to a voice that will take you there? Third, be realistic. Do not overextend yourself. Don't invest every last penny of savings that you have. Keep something back in case something does go wrong because oftentimes things will, right? So just don't overextend yourself. Principle number four, learn from others. You've learned from people in the past and if they're not getting you to the place that you wanna be eventually, listen to the voice of other people. There's a guy named Robert Kiyosaki that I want to encourage you to become familiar with. He wrote a book called Rich Dad, Poor Dad, and he wrote Rich Dad's Cash Flow Quadrant, A Guide to Financial Freedom. Those two books will be very, very important books for you to become familiar with. Those two books would, will begin to change your, your basic understanding because I was the son of what Robert Kiyosaki would call the poor dad. And it was the matter of Hey, get a job, stick with it. A rolling stone gathers no moss, so don't keep rolling around from job to job. Now, that worked back in the post-depression uh, era. Corporations took care of their employees. That's not necessarily the case now. So learn from other people. Another book that is very, very good and one that you should become familiar with is called Principles by Ray Dalio. So learning from other people. And then the fifth principle is this, start small, but for goodness sakes, get started. Hey, this is Brent Haggerty, Gulf Premier Sarasota. My information's on the screen. I would love to just chat with you. You can pick up the phone and call me if you'd like. You can make a comment. You can ask me some more questions, but I believe that you have what it takes to become financially free. I encourage you, put God first, Put your family second, and don't worry about what other people have told you. You make your own decisions. Think logically. Be realistic. Don't stretch too far. Learn from other people and get started, my friend. Talk to you soon.